All right, let's get started. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. If you've attended our webinars in the past, you'll notice we're trying out a new time zone to, to reach out to new geographies. So thanks for joining us now. And welcome to all our first timers. Today's webinar is about understanding CBDCs. And for those who maybe joined uh, not knowing what that acronym means, it stands for Central Bank Digital Currencies. And last month, the Stellar Development Foundation uh, we released a white paper on this topic looking at the policy and technical considerations that policymakers and regulators uh, should be thinking about when they're exploring this technology. You know, at SDF, we just really want to be a resource to help folks understand the opportunities that CBDCs and this technology present, um, which, is, which is also why we're hosting this webinar for thought leaders to share their perspectives on these important considerations. So we're going to divide uh, this conversation into two parts. Uh, first, with a look at the policy considerations for CBDCs with a panel discussion led by our CEO and Executive Director, Danelle Dixon. And then we'll bring on our COO, Jason, to talk about the technical considerations and look at how these are being built and piloted in the real world today uh, with an ecosystem partner who has those boots on the ground. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Danelle. Well, thank you, Lauren. Good evening or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, the big question driving our conversation today is why should a central bank consider a central bank digital currency or a CBDC? Uh, as Lauren mentioned, SDF recently put out a white paper that tackles this question. It's a policymakers and regulators guidebook to CBDCs. And in that same vein, we invited thinking leaders and implementers to discuss the topic with us and to dig into some of the key considerations that we laid out in that report. So here with us, we've got Benedict Nolans from the BIS Innovation Hub. Benedict, could you uh, share a little bit about yourself and maybe some background about the BIS Hub? Hello, hi, I'm the head of the BIS Innovation Hub Hong Kong Center. So my background is actually in banking for most of my career, but after that, I went to regulation. Um, I also worked uh, a year with Circle when they launched to SDC, uh, and I worked for another year after that with SE Ventures, the Standard Chartered Venture Arm. And pursuant to that, I'm now at the BIS uh, Innovation Hub. And in fact, I, I had two projects to do with CBDC. Uh, one is a wholesale CBDC project, and the other one is a retail CBDC project. So we can dig into that a little, a little more later. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, with all that background, it's going to be great to be able to contribute to this discussion. And then Robin Noonan from the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Robin, could you introduce yourself briefly and, and tell us how you've been working on CBDCs? Thank you so much, uh, Danelle, to you and SDF to, for the invitation to this webinar to be part of this important discussion today. So um, I'm Head of Policy Analysis at the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. AFI is an organization that shares really a very similar mission to that of SDF to create equitable access for all to the financial system. But the community that we represent are financial regulators and central banks from across the global south. And of course, they're regulators that have core mandates for financial stability and financial integrity, but who have added financial inclusion very much to their mission as well, and have embraced a responsible innovation as a key means of achieving that. So we really look at central bank digital currencies in that vein as an opportunity to advance the financial inclusion goals um, that our members have, and our membership does include a number of central banks, such as People's Bank of China, Central Bank of the Bahamas, Central Bank of Nigeria as well, that have been amongst the early pioneers in this space. I'm so happy to share more on that as we go into this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. It's so great for that with that background and all the folks that you're currently engaged with. It's going to bring a lot also from that perspective to this discussion. And finally, last but not least, Josh Lipsky of the Atlantic Council. Josh, can you share a little bit about who you are? and also what you're looking at when it comes to CBDCs at the Atlantic Council. Well, happy to thanks to Nell and Stellar Development Foundation for having me back. It's always a pleasure to be at these events and learn from everyone here. So look forward to the conversation. I'm the director of the Geoeconomic Center at the Atlantic Council. And a core pillar of our work at the Atlantic Council is understanding the future of money. We've undertaken a multi-year CBDC project that we call the CBDC Tracker Project. We'll share it in the chat. 
and we map what's happening all over the world and the rise of CBDCs, not just the development phase countries are in, but the technology choices they're using, the design choices they're undertaking, and the cross-border testing that has happened, which Benedict knows well from her work, especially on the wholesale side. So these are rapid changes. When we first started this project two and a half years ago, there were 35 countries we were looking at, there are now 91. So it just gives you a sense of the rapid acceleration in this space, which I'm sure we'll discuss tonight. Prior to the Atlantic Council, I was at the IMF as an advisor to Christine Lagarde, and it was there that I first learned about CBDCs many years ago and realized their potential and how they could, in an ideal world, work with stable coins and crypto for a healthier digital financial ecosystem. So that's our mission at the Atlantic Council and pleased to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Josh. It's been so great to be able to engage with some of your seminars with respect to CBDCs. You learn a lot when folks that are actually doing the implementation have these discussions. So grateful for all the things that you guys do there. So we're excited to have all of you here with us. Uh, you're all working on CBDCs in various capacities. And so it's gonna be great for us to dig into some questions. So I'm gonna get started. Benedict, my first question is for you. And it relates to the January 22nd data from the BIS on the status of CBDCs around the world. Um, as both Josh uh, and, and um, Robin mentioned, you see them growing in terms of the interest from them. And we're logging over 13 billion in transactions with the China pilot. Uh, the, and there are now three retail CBDCs in the Bahamas, the Eastern Caribbean and Nigeria, and one coming soon in Jamaica. So there are 28 pilots and 68 central banks that have communicated publicly about their CBDC work. So with that as background, what does all this data mean? So thank you, Danelle. So I think it's uh, <clears throat> easy, as I said, for, for simplicity purposes, but likely also for practical ones, uh, to distinguish between wholesale CBDC and retail CBDC. So a lot of the uh, live projects, uh, in fact, are the projects that are in advanced pilot are, are retail CBDC projects. So what they do in practice is uh, to a large extent actually replace that physical bill, uh, our coin, but more so bill with an electronic bill and make that interoperable across payment wallets and typically within the country. So these are very important characteristics to keep in mind. So these retail CBDCs are typically within a country, interoperable between wallets. So one of the, in my view, probably the best example to understand why people would do that is the ECNY. So uh, the ECNY paper of last summer, which, which uh, was fully published, set out the motivations behind the ECNY. And while there are many, I will only focus at, at this stage on two of them, which is the, the fact that there was less competition in the wallet sector. As you know, it was quite a concentrated sector with two leading players. Um, and that led people to be in a wallet. And if they needed to be out of that wallet, actually very substantial fees applied. And what I mean with substantial is several percent to withdraw your money from the wallet back into the banking system. So this is one of the concerns that um, in some the wallets become closed systems. And you saw that actually in a pretty uh, in a pretty significant uh, example in China. So the first object of the ECNY is to be interoperable between these wallets. That's the first object of it. And then the second um, the second motivation, which you will see in all of these retail CBDCs typically so far, is financial inclusion. And that is also why in financially included markets, like for example, Hong Kong is one, um, you see that pressure towards the retail CBTC being much less. Uh, but as the Stellar paper also raises, uh, for example, there is uh, likely for, for, for countries with less financial inclusion, there's likely a potentially very strong benefit of having uh, CBDC for uh, credit analytic purposes that can assist in financial inclusion. So that's just to put the backdrop on retail CBDC. 
Now, a lot of people talk about wholesale CBDC, and one of the fl flagship projects uh, in, in this context is happening out of my center, which is the so-called M-Bridge, a multi-CBDC uh, bridge. All of these, just to be very clear, are pilots, and none are actually ready for, for any form uh, of rollout. Uh, but so the the in, intention or the goal of these type of infrastructures is really to speed up transfer across countries. So that is a cross border study, you could say. And in this case is a platform with multiple CBDCs so that these transfers can happen across multiple borders of parties that want to interact. And obviously the central banks and the banks would be participants on those platforms. So I would say, this second example, this wholesale CBDC, in the current three studies ongoing, each of which are ongoing within the BISIH, one in Switzerland, one in Singapore, and one in Hong Kong, each of these, um, I consider them closer to payment infrastructures. So while there is minting and burning on the platform, and while the same terminology is being used, they are more akin to a payment infrastructure. Uh, and again, the, the target is to reduce uh, the cost of cross-border payments and increase the speed. Now, when you ask how does that all interrelate with what else is going on in the private markets, um, for example, there are indeed uh, stable coins. So if you compare them to retail CBDC, st stable coins are not currently linked to one national border, right? They cross borders. So they're quite different in that regard from a retail CBDC. They're, they're also likely in usage on the short term going to be different from a wholesale CBDC because I think a wholesale CBDC is more likely to be used for very large transfers that need the safety of that kind of uh, central bank operated uh, system. So I, I wouldn't say they're completely overlapping. I think there's often this thinking, does one eliminate the other, et cetera. I personally don't think we're, we're anywhere close to that. Um, now, maybe a last point on, on stablecoins specifically is I do think they'll offer competition to, uh, to go back to the wallets. <laughs> <laughs> because in fact, um, the, the costs on those wallets are pretty significant. So um, I've been monitoring one of the wallets, which I want side, but every single time a transfer, I make a transfer relatively small, uh, the costs are up to 10%. So it's, it's not small costs, uh, these costs of international transfers. And I'm talking here of $80. So in some, these wholesale CBDCs we're working on is for the $100 million. It's not for the $80. And the $80 with the cost of 10%, there's a lot of room to bring that down to a much lower uh, number. So that's my introduction and I'll pass it back to you, Danelle. That, that was phenomenal. Thank you so much, Benedict. I mean, part of the challenge that we have just in crypto and blockchain is those off ramps and making sure that those off ramps can actually support the need of lower fees. The 10% is clearly too high. And so CBDCs, there's some thought that CBDCs could help with those off ramping, but Robin, the BIS data shows that one of the main motivations for central banks in emerging, in, uh, is in emerging economies is financial inclusion, as you mentioned in, in your introduction. So given the focus of your organization, I'd love to get your insight on how a CBDC could promote financial inclusion. Thanks so much, Danelle, for that question. Um, just to give a bit of context here, I think broadly in terms of the motivations for central banks getting into CBDCs, we see a couple of narratives that are out there. I think there's a narrative that characterizes CBDCs as an essentially defensive play from central banks, which runs that banknotes and coins are slowly disappearing, transactions are going increasingly digital, and we're increasingly seeing new forms of digital money that are gaining popularity rapidly. So this narrative is seeing CBDC as a kind of reaction to maintain um, the relevance of central banks as we move into an era of digital money. But I think there's also another narrative out there that positions CBDCs as a more offensive player around grasping the opportunity. And I think that narrative is more common, in fact, amongst the Global South jurisdictions 
that, as Benedict mentioned, still suffer from this plight of financial exclusion for a significant part of their um, populations. And under this narrative, I think central banks are seen as an opportunity to help enable universal, safe, and reliable access to payments for all, not as a displacement to private sector activity, but actually as a complement um, to what is there already and to what might be coming from the private sector in the future as well. Of course, we need to look at you know, how credible are these arguments that are being made that CBDCs will deliver on financial inclusion. And it's simply too early to give a definitive answer to that question, you know, 18 months into the, the first national rollout, if you like, in, in the Bahamas, we're yet to have that comprehensive evaluation. But I think what we can distill are you know, the, the hypothetical linkages that are being made that will give us a kind of framework to assess this going forward. So I think the arguments are mainly around three areas. Um, the first one is really to do with enhancing the efficiency and resilience of payments, because um, as CBTCs are rolled out, it will certainly be a requirement for them to facilitate uh, real-time payments, almost instant settlement and negligible costs um, as well. Resilience has also been an important part of the argument. Um, it's no accident that countries like the Bahamas, the Eastern Caribbean have been amongst the first movers here because the payment systems are frequently disrupted by hurricanes or other climate events. And so having the CBDC infrastructure could be an alternative to maintain resilience of the payment system. And of course, in that regard, offline um, payments functionality is something that is you know, being built in by more central banks deploying um, CBDCs as a necessary um, criteria. I think the second set of arguments are more around safety and trust. You know, trust in financial services is very uh, country specific and it's still a significant barrier um, to financial inclusion for many. Um, and of course, there has been a proliferation of non-bank e-money products that have played a very significant role, mobile money, e-wallets, in driving financial inclusion. But there's not necessarily um, complete protection of customer funds that are held in those, um, those products. There's not necessarily deposit insurance coverage. So there's nothing that's really safer than a direct claim on the central bank. And that is what a CBDC um, could enable. So it could help overcome the trust gap that still um, persists in some cases. Then I think the third argument is, is a very important one around facilitating um, universal access. Um, we know there has been a lot of a lot of innovation that's driven um, financial inclusion upwards and has really moved the needle quite significantly. But there are still vulnerable groups that are disproportionately left out of the system. Rural communities, uh, women are disproportionately excluded, forcibly displaced persons as well. So this is perhaps an opportunity for financial inclusion really to be front and center at the design stage and not trying to build it in um, as an afterthought, as a subsequent policy um, priority as we've had to do with the, the traditional system. So I think those are the key arguments that are, that are being made. Of course, you may or may not agree that a CBDC is the only or even the best way to um, achieve those goals. But I think what I'd say there is this is too, too important a um, problem and the scale of the problem is such we can't leave any option off the table um, at this stage. So each country is going to need to look for itself at its own circumstances, whether a CBDC is the best option to achieve those financial inclusion goals vis-a-vis -vis, um, other alternatives that, that might be available. And central banks are going to, to do that in a careful and methodical way um, through feasibility assessments, through the discussion papers that are now being published and, and through wide engagement. So for now, I think we need to keep an open mind and uh, watch how the space develops on that. That's so great, Robin, thank you. I think part of it too is from my standpoint, at least and probably from yours, making sure that that financial inclusion angle is something that each of them consider because even we don't wanna come up with a system that is essentially the same as the existing system. And we have a lot of folks de-risked from those systems. So uh, Josh, I'm gonna come back to the Atlantic Council's uh, CBDC tracker that you mentioned at the outset. We've just heard uh, Robin and Benedict talk a lot about what's happening out there with respect to CBDCs and how folks are thinking about it. The data tells us that many countries are testing CBDCs. So why do you think that that testing is relevant? What do you think central banks are learning from this process? 
So I fully agree with what Benedict and Robin said. And to add one additional narrative to Robin's, there's a looming thing that's happened around the world over the past two years, and that's the pandemic. And that is another driver of CBDCs because central banks and fiscal authorities in almost every country in the world realized they needed a better, safter, facer way to transmit monetary and fiscal policy to their citizens. And that was very present as the pandemic took hold. And that was really one of the drivers of CBDC adoption, in addition to the rise of crypto and stable coins and monetary sovereignty and the things that have been raised. Now, when we talk about financial inclusion, I think it's really important to understand that the comparison is a little different in advanced economies than emerging markets, because the use case in an advanced economy isn't necessarily financial inclusion, although that could be a goal and should be a goal, it's as much financial security, which is those people who are already in the banking system, can they get payments faster? Can they get payments safer and cheaper? And I do think it's important from a policymaker's perspective in Washington, the term financial inclusion is often thrown around, but it means different things in different countries. That doesn't mean that CBDCs can't have a use, but they'd be used differently in different types of economies. So what are we learning from the tracker? A few things I'd point out. First question is to intermediate or not intermediate. And the paper does this very well and lays this out very nicely. And the answer is we will intermediate. Every central bank in the world that's in a pilot phase, in the development phase, and the few that are fully launched are intermediating their CBDCs, meaning they're working through the commercial banking system or fintech service providers. They are not doing this direct to consumer. And it's clear the Fed would certainly take that route. They do not wanna be consumer facing to 300 million Americans if they have a digital dollar. So it's very clear, even in China, working through an intermediated system. And that's a clear design signal that two years ago was more of an open question. Now, the second question is to tier or not to tier. How do we have the wallets when do we have AML, KYC, know your customer requirements kick in? How much can I hold in a wallet? Can I hold under $500 and do that anonymously? If it's over $1,000, do certain accounting and verification and authentication requirements kick in? And the answer we see in most countries is there has to be some kind of tiering. ECNY is probably going to have four levels of tiering. We know the sand dollar has a tiering system. So it's very clear the signal from countries around the world. There's going to be tiering within the wallets. How an individual country does that has to do with their own requirements, but also how they deal with international regulations and standard setting. Then the third issue, to DLT or not DLT, what technology am I going to use in my central bank digital currency? That's not as clear cut. You see countries using DLT, you see the RICS bank, ECNY has what they call a hybrid DLT system where they use DLT in the reconciliation on the back end, but really a centralized ledger for the retail transactions. So this is a mixed bag. South Korea is piloting a project that will be DLT based. Other countries are doing centralized. So it leans toward the DLT solution, but not in a fully open system like the paper discusses, really more countries right now are testing a kind of their own permission based system. So that's where the pilot stages are right now. And then the big question, you know, as we think about where is this going today, we just moved Russia into pilot stage. So now you have 19 of the G20 economies, 19 of the G20, Argentina, the only exception, Robin, so we can talk about that, you know, and not really in a CBDC development, what is the standard setting body? for 90% of the global economy that is now pursuing a CBDC. From our perspective at the Atlantic Council, what we talk about in Washington is the G20 is a good forum because Russia and China are in the G20. You have the US, you have the G7 economies, and you could bring this to the table, all the large economies that are pursuing CBDCs. Could we have some cohesion consensus on international standard setting? And so that's where we think this is heading. And the Fed wants to be much more involved in that process the issue for them is they need a model to bring to the table to be involved in the process because countries fairly ask, well, what is your option and how can we build off that? So I'll leave it there, but these are the trends we're seeing right now. And so you touched on this a little bit and I just wanna follow up, but the open versus the closed networks. What do you think central banks are looking at when they're making the decision whether to use an open or a closed or permissioned network? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times they're looking at what other countries are doing. So they're trying to look at models and say, how does this work for me? They're thinking about cybersecurity and resiliency of their system. They're thinking about their legislatures and oversight. 
and what they will be able to get approved from a sort of authoritarian oversight perspective. So all of these are weighing on them and I think are leading them to this permission system where basically they say we can have some of the advantages of DLT, but we feel, and I think the paper makes a good point of saying this might not be true, but we feel that we have more security this way. And I think countries are open to hearing something different on that, but it needs to be very clearly explained to them why a fully open system can still protect the security and resiliency of their financial payments network. And the other thing we see as these CBDCs develop are struggles with the offline capability. You know, China is working very hard on this and they seem to have solved it, but other central banks are really stumbling on this offline capability, just back to the initial financial inclusion point. You need to be able to use this offline if it's really gonna have the ability of cash. And then the final point I'll just say is privacy which we didn't talk about, but certainly in the West, in the US and Europe and other countries is going to be a major holdup, no matter what kind of system this is based on. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you with respect to this. And I also get concerned if we have the permissioned networks where the innovation might come from. So it's one of the things that we like to raise all the time. Open networks allow innovation from money. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the balance I think that we need to look at. Uh, Benedict. Uh, the conversations with respect to CBDCs, just I think about from when I started at um, SDF in 2019 to today, it's just a remarkable shift. So what have you seen in the, in the shift over the last few years with respect to CBDCs in that conversation? Yeah, I think uh, to put it quite simply, CBDCs have gone from uh, being something that people weren't certain they should study to something that is now a must study. Uh, for for anecdotal context, when, when I was hired for this role, when the interviews were going on, which was quite some months before I joined, CBDC was not in the scope. And by the time I joined, uh, two CBDC projects were in the scope. So I guess that gives you a good sense for, for the speed of evolution. Um, and, and definitely there is a lot of testing going on, but I, I think also we need to be a little bit humble to say that not, not all the answers are on the table yet. So to go back to uh, my distinction between retail and wholesale, um, the wholesale ones that we're working on, they are by nature interoperable because that's the whole point, right? <laughs> the whole point is to interoperate across jurisdictions. Uh, but the retail ones are currently being built on completely different technologies. And in some, that's why they become very national. Now, now maybe that's how it turns out, but uh, I just want to point it out that this uh, interoperability issue uh, certainly deserves uh, probably more attention. Um, and, and definitely uh, open systems may offer that faster, but there are also these, these other concerns that uh, as Josh says, central banks are grappling with, uh, including to a large extent, um, the safety, the safety of the system or the proven nature of the system, uh, the support for the system, etc. So that's why often they gravitate towards either a centralized system or a DLT system. Yeah, it's always fascinating to me when, when, when we're engaging with central banks or policymakers on this. And then one of the first questions they ask about Stellar is, well, who owns it and who controls it? So that's the default because that's what they're used to. And then the funny thing I always like to point out is it's the same as the internet. So it's the thing that we're using every day that no one owns and controls, but works very well. So it is, uh, there is a conversation that we need to get and, and focus on a bit more there. Um, so Robin, in terms of when you're thinking about policy and regulatory issues and central banks, what are the three most important things that you think they need to consider when exploring a CBDC? And thanks, Dana. I think um, one issue I would put on the table there is definitely the privacy one, how to maintain the right balance there um, with financial integrity concerns and AML and all of that. And I think, uh, as Josh indicated, the approach that Bahamas has taken of tiered access, um, whereby um, accounts up to certain transaction limits can be opened without the full ID and verification process. I think that is probably a route that uh, many um, central banks will go down as, as a means of finding the right balance there. I think there's a set of issues around mitigating the risk of bank disintermediation that's quite at the forefront uh, of mind in the, the design choices as well. I think no central bank wants to be taking over all of the functions of um, the private sector here. It's very much about a partnership approach. 
um, a two-tier approach. And that, so there were policy questions there around, for example, not paying interest or limiting the interest rate that is paid, or maybe around capping the amount that each citizen um, can hold of the, the CBDC to avoid any kind of um, flight to safety um, risks that could jeopardize financial stability. But for me, I think probably the key set of policy issues is going to be this one around last mile access. Um, we can't afford for CBDC as it's de deployed to be another system that works for the 80%, but not for the 20% who are excluded. And there is a risk that um, you know, this could actually exacerbate the digital divide if due attention is not given to that policy question. And the Central Bank of Kenya put out a nice um, discussion paper this week, which actually describes CBDC as a double-edged sword for financial inclusion. There is this tremendous opportunity here to deliver on inclusion goals, but we need to be very mindful of those unintended consequences as well and make sure that the 100% um, access um, is there and is built into the design from the get-go. I think that is such an important point. And it's one of the things I always talk about how our financial system today was not intended to be built for the few, um, and but in fact, it has been built for the few and not for the many, and that's the challenge. So we can't make that mistake again. I agree with you a thousand percent. So we only have just three more minutes. And, but before we wrap up, I would just love to hear from each of you and you can choose which way to answer this question. I could ask you, what do you think the main trend will be in 2022? But the other part of it is, what do you want to see as the trend in 2022? And I'll leave it to each of you to answer. So Josh, I'll start with you. Okay, wow. Okay, great question. So just two two points to make, and then I'll get to that uh, based on what Robin said. The first is that people need to want to use CBDCs. And we sometimes forget that because we spend so much time worrying about the risk, as we should, uh, that we forget that this is intended for people to use and like it and find it useful and helpful for their lives. And I always just like to say that at these events because we get so into the weeds of the design and the elements, and I do this myself, that it's supposed to be useful and you're supposed to want people to use it. The second thing I'd say is that this is a policy decision as much as it's a technical decision. And this has to be every country that does this successfully and is doing this successfully does this in coordination with their legislatures and with their finance ministries. It is not just a central banking decision because it's a policy choice for a country to pursue a CBDC. And I think that's really important to remember. The trend I think we're going to see, and Benedict knows this well from the work she's doing, is cross-border wholesale testing. I think you're going to see more countries coming online. You see it in our tracker. You have Malaysia, you have South Africa, you have Australia. You have a series of countries. It's not just China and Enbridge, which is certainly doing it, but a series of projects. So that's the trend I think you're going to see. The trend I hope you're gonna see is the US getting involved in that, not just on the retail side, but on the wholesale side. And the US being much more involved through the G20 and international fora and saying, we would like to talk about wholesale cross-border collaboration. And we would have maybe not a model to bring to the table, but some ideas and some standards we think are important. That's awesome. Okay, Benedict, how about you? Yeah, so, so I have more short-term goals. <laughs> I would just uh, like to see that our pilots and our testing at least lead to, to some uh, important uh, results, either on feasibility or the opposite conclusions on, on, on where things are not yet uh, feasible. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my, my main uh, goal, I guess, for the next 12 months. I like that goal. Robin, how about you? Thanks. Well, we're certainly going to see a lot more deployments, a lot more testing and a lot more data emerging, which is going to be very exciting to analyze. But I think one prediction I'd make is that we'll start to see more of an acceptance of coexistence of public and private um, digital money. And I think we're starting to see a shift there because, of course, there have been jurisdictions that have simultaneously decided to try to prohibit um, privately issued digital currencies and crypto, but at the same time announced that they're exploring CBDC almost as a sort of alternative. But I think we're starting to see some contradictions in, in that position. And a CBDC will not fulfill all of the use cases that a stable coin or other private currencies might. Um, and prohibition is unlikely to be effective as a policy. Um, approach there, it's likely to have a lot of unintended consequences for innovation as well. So I think we are seeing regulators um, around the world move in the direction of um, clear regulatory frameworks 
um, alongside exploring the feasibility of CBDCs. So I think it won't be a choice of either public money or private money, but how do these coexist together? What are the different use cases for each and the interrelationships? Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you to everyone uh, for joining this conversation. Honestly, we are very lucky to have each of you focusing on these issues and your organizations as well. I'm grateful that you took the time to be with us here today. And I just wanna remind everyone who's joined us that you can check out the report on our website. And I'm going to quickly hand it back to Lauren because we're almost right on time. Thank you guys for we're joining We're so close. Us. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. That was really a fascinating discussion. And you know, I think actually what Josh was just saying there at the end is a great segue into where we're going next, which is um, you know, it's easy to get into the weeds of the technical aspects because there's so many decisions to make when you're considering how to build uh, a CBDC. And so that is kind of what we're gonna get into here next um, with Jason, our COO, who's gonna uh, talk really about what it is to build this, what are the considerations you'll make um, in those building decisions, and then talk to someone who's doing it on the ground um, with uh, in, in real life. So uh, Jason, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Jason Chapala. I'm the COO of the Stellar Development Foundation. And uh, as Lauren just said, um, Simon and I, Simon's the CIO of BIT, we're going to be talking a bit more about the, the technical considerations. So First, just wanted to walk through uh, a few more high level technical concepts. So I think the best way to think about um, what we're seeing around CBDCs and, and in particular, the potential for open networks is there's a real paradigm shift. The old paradigm was if you are designing an electronic money system and you wanna keep that safe and secure for obvious reasons, with old technology, with legacy technology, that meant controlling the infrastructure completely. That meant controlling the databases that hold the ledgers and the messaging systems for making updates to those ledgers. That can lead though to a disconnected system. On the next slide, we see blockchain gives us the ability for a new paradigm where you can have safe, secure digital assets even though they're on a common infrastructure. And so again, I think that's the key takeaway. Um, and that's, that's why people are so excited about CBDCs. And that's certainly why we at the Stellar Development Foundation are, and in particular, are excited about the possibility for open networks, uh, open permissionless technologies and networks to lead to a more connected interoperable world. So on the next slide, I, I wanted to just speak a bit to uh, what is possible on open networks and is already happening. So the, the first point is secure asset issuance. Um, many of you may have heard of the concepts of account-based money and token-based money. Um, and so the, the you know, account-based is pretty self-explanatory. There's an account and you, you update balances in that account. Token-based classic example would be cash, of course. It's a, a physical token that you, you pass back and forth in the, the physical world. What blockchains enable is you can create these digital things, you know, these tokens um, that of course are digital, they are electronic, but they behave like physical tokens and you can issue those onto networks. Um, that is a, a really fundamentally new possibility. And again, we believe that open networks are uh, really essential to creating a system that actually acts token-based. You know, true token-based money may require open networks. If you have a closed permission to system, it, it eventually can start to feel like an account-based system. So we're really excited for the possibility for secure asset issuance. Um, Blockchain technology can also provide uh, enhanced compliance capabilities. So on uh, Stellar, for example, there is a feature called auth required where an issuer who creates an asset, um, you know, think a stable coin issuer or a central bank issuing a CBDC, if they want, they can uh, specify that that asset is auth required, which means they need to authorize accounts before they can hold the asset. And this again speaks to that paradigm shift. In that legacy technology, the only way to control 
where an asset can go or where a balance can go is to control that full infrastructure. With blockchain technology, even though these assets are issued onto open networks, the issuer can still have a certain amount of control over its assets. So if they want to, for example, make it so an account needs to be KYC'd, of course, for, for an AML reasons, they can do that first, then allow that account to hold that particular asset. And then from there, it can be transferred freely among the accounts that have been authorized. Similarly, on Stellar, uh, there's clawback functionality. So if an issuer turns that feature on, if there's uh, you know, a fraudulent transaction or for any other reason, the issuer wants to uh, claw back a transaction, it can do that. But again, the point is there's open networks, even though anyone can join the network, you can still have the types of features and capabilities that we're used to seeing on closed networks. Um, next is the topic of transaction finality. I'm sure some or maybe most of the people listening to this are familiar with the idea that on a network like Bitcoin, for example, in order to be certain that a transaction has gone through and will not be reversed, you have to wait for multiple so-called confirmations. Think of this as you have to wait until multiple new blocks are added to the blockchain. Um, and that's, that's because of the way Bitcoin and certain other networks uh, form consensus. They use something called proof of work. There's also another category of consensus protocol called proof of stake. Um, it doesn't have to be that way though. There are other networks, uh, Stellar included, that use other types of consensus protocols where even after a single confirmation, the holder of that asset can have true finality, you know, full certainty that they now hold that asset and it can't be reversed later. And again, this is possible even on an open network. Um, so you can get this sort of finality and certainty that's necessary for something like a payment system. And then finally, uh, like many of the, the earlier speakers on the panel were talking about, interoperability between these assets, of course, is essential. And on open networks, because of that shared infrastructure, you, you, you sort of get this automatically, or you could almost say you get it for free. Um, and even across networks. So I know that a lot of people, when, when talking about CBDCs, they ask the very natural question, well, what will happen if one country issues a CBDC on this network, you know, this DLT or this network, and another issues it on a different one? With open networks, because you know, they are permissionless, it is very easy to link up between those two networks and, and achieve that sort of interoperability. So these are some of the, the high level uh, categories or, or technical ideas to consider when thinking about CBDCs. Um, on the next slide, we get into uh, some of the, the different types. And you know, if you listen to the panel that just wrapped up, we definitely touched on a lot of this. So to review, um, there's, you know, there's kind of three main models. There's, you can think of it as public CBDC. We talked about uh, um, that on the panel, the idea of the central bank directly issuing the, uh, the, the asset. There's also um, what's called synthetic CBDC. This was a term coined by the IMF. The idea behind that would be um, if the, perhaps the central bank doesn't even need to actually issue the asset. Instead, um, banks or other financial institutions, or in, including non-bank financial institutions, could issue an asset but if they can then back it with reserves directly at the central bank, um, that is a synthetic CBDC. And then finally, um, people sometimes refer to a third category called uh, public-private CBDC, which is sort of a combination of the two. In that case, the central bank would actually issue the asset, but then the distribution of it to consumers and end users would be done through intermediaries um, such as banks and other financial institutions. And as we heard from, uh, I believe it was Josh on the panel, this is, you know, pretty much everyone is, is thinking that when it comes to consumers, there will be intermediation. Uh, banks and other institutions will, will sit in between. So on the next slide, we, we have just kind of a, a simple diagram here. This is really showing an example of what public-private could look like. So as you can see, 
the central bank is the one actually issuing the asset. Um, you know, it has a, an issuing account, a distribution account on the network itself where the asset is going to live. But then that is sent to commercial banks or, you know, really on this diagram, we should show uh, non-bank institutions as well. But the point being, there is this intermediation. And then you have consumer wallets and the end users on the other side. And importantly, in this diagram, we're showing uh, an authorization API. The idea would be those institutions in the middle, they're the ones performing KYC and doing other compliance um, you know, functions to, to vet consumers and users before they can receive the asset. The central bank would not have to do that uh, themselves. So uh, before we, we switch over to talking to Simon, just two more points I wanna make. Um, two key priorities when thinking about CBDCs, and of course we heard about these on our panel. The first is interoperability. It's essential that as central banks and lawmakers and technology companies are thinking about central bank digital currencies, that we keep interoperability in mind because it would be a shame to go through all this work to come up with this new, exciting, novel form of money for it to just once again become siloed and disconnected. And you know, quite frankly, that's why we at Stellar um, and others in the, industry, in, in the industry are so excited about open networks. It's this concern that even if it is a distributed ledger, you know, even if it's using blockchain, if it's on a closed network, it runs the risk of once again, these things will become siloed. And, and yes, maybe it will be a little better than it is today, but we'll run into the same pattern, the same general problem. And in the future, we'll be right back where we are right now. So as everyone is building these, it's essential that they keep interoperability in mind. And then uh, in addition to interoperability, there is programmability. Um, so I think this is a really interesting concept. Um, the, the classic example that people often like to use is, could you make it so that um, an individual could only spend the CBDC uh, you know, on, on groceries, things like that. Could you build in controls on what can actually be done uh, with the digital asset? This is really exciting. This obviously is also represents a potentially very different capability than is available today in, in other forms of money. Um, sometimes when people talk about programmability in this context, they're talking about so-called smart contracts which would be, the, which would be um, computer code that is run in a decentralized manner on a blockchain. So instead of one party um, you know, running that code on its server, it is sort of being run across an entire network. I think it's really important when um, stakeholders are considering programmability, they should think in terms of what is the logic or what are the use cases where that should be done in a decentralized fashion, like I just described? And then what are the situations where you actually want that logic to still live in a centralized place? Uh, or in the, another way to think of this is, which cases do you want programmability at the network layer? And which cases do you want the programmability at the application layer, where there is still a centralized entity controlling that? Um, our view is that a lot of the programmability that people are thinking about and want really should still be at the application layer. Um, and, and, you know, we're about to talk to Simon and Bit is one of those applications where they're, they're building the software that central banks and financial institutions would use um, and it would sit on top of the network layer. You actually want the logic to sit there. There may be other cases where it does make sense that you actually want the logic at the network layer and you want a true sort of smart contract um, but we think people should be very careful before jumping to that when it comes to CBDC. So it's a very interesting area. It is something that many, if not all, central banks are focused on. Um, and when they do surveys, such as uh, you know, the ones that Josh is talking about that the Atlantic Council does, um, it, it comes up again and again. So this will be a really interesting consideration um, as we're all building. And so uh, with that, I would like to bring Simon um, into the conversation. Uh, so Simon, 
great to see you. Do you want to just give uh, just a brief introduction of yourself and then we can, we can jump into the questions? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so Simon Chantry here. I'm co-founder and chief information officer at BIT. Uh, as Jason mentioned, BIT offers our digital currency management system. That's our primary product. And the digital currency management system consists of software products for the monetary authority in their roles of minting and distributing in uh, CBDC, uh, as well as monetary policy tool sets, economic analysis, uh, as well as uh, methods for interacting with their commercial banks. Uh, the next rung, we also service commercial banks and enable them to uh, request newly issued currency from the central bank and, and enable them to provide digital currency services to their enterprise and retail clients. Um, we are transaction network agnostic, super excited to be working with Stellar. Uh, and the reason we did that was uh, sort of, you know, uh, in, in the early days, there were a lot of great contenders for transaction networks. And we knew that we wanted to focus on the, the tool sets for monetary authorities. And so that's uh, how the digital currency management system has evolved. Excellent. And, um, you know, you, you sort of humbly didn't mention it in your intro, but a uh, bit is, has worked with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria. So like Lauren said, you know, we wanted to bring in someone with a lot of experience, boots on the ground, and I'm not sure anyone sort of has more boots on the ground at the moment. So where, where, where I kind of wanted to take this is um, what it's like when you are actually having these conversations with central banks and, and working through these projects. So first off, in those initial conversations, so you're, you're first starting to talk to a central bank, um, don't have a pilot yet. What are what are the sorts of questions they ask, or what are the key uh, topics that are coming up again and again in the, in that initial phase? Yeah, it's a good question, Jason, and it's certainly changed over the years as well. Uh, now, you know, we're standing with five deployments across three continents, and the questions, the knowledge level has has definitely increased since uh, our, our initial, you know, the initial contract we signed with the ECCB was in 2019, uh, and so fast forward to today, and there's certainly more knowledge been been gained in uh, within the central banks. That being said, um, there are there's a, there's a stance from central banks where it's clear that they recognize the movements in crypto over the last decade um, are very substantial. It's created a massive asset class and there's all kinds of, you know, really interesting functionality that can be achieved uh, by utilizing what I refer to as internet native payment networks. And so you can picture our challenge as, as a company is uh, taking elements of the open source uh, digital currency innovations that have taken place over the last decade and then applying them to our, our tool sets. So um, to answer your question more directly, they typically want to know what sort of functionality they can expect. How is it going to achieve some of the common goals that we hear, financial inclusion, increased economic activity, increased competition for payment service providers and fintechs in the region, as well as the commercial banks, of course. Um, you know, how, how it could affect for disaster preparedness. All There's sort of fairly standard uh, uh, features that we're seeing, you know, be requested more and more, especially as, as knowledge grows. Um, and then, of course, there are details that are specific to the country that we're yeah. speaking with, right? So there's 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 quite a few common uh, elements, and then also highly specific features that uh, uh, that central banks desire based on the economic and financial financial conditions of their country. So that's again our challenge is is um, you know consuming the requirements. Um, borrowing from the open source movement, utilizing uh, elements of it, and then also designing our own elements that we suspect are, are useful and would provide a rich feature set to monetary authorities and financial institutions primarily. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that point about how the, the desired feature set is standardizing to an extent is really interesting. And I, <clears throat> I think it has helped the conversation just generally move forward more quickly because now people are sort of, agree on the sorts of things that matter and the things we should be talking about and that we can make progress on those. Whereas before, um, I think it was like Benedict was saying, I mean, people were still just, is this a good idea at all? And now it's sort of, this is a good idea and these are the characteristics that should matter. And so that, that's really interesting that it is starting to standardize, but it's also, I mean, personally, and I'm, I, I bet you agree, part of what is so interesting about this is the fact that every country is different, every, you know, they, they do have these sort of differences in what they need. Um, so it's just such a yeah. cool, cool uh, space. So, 
So now, you know, now let's kind of move forward to once you're actually working on a project, like you said, you have five deployments across three continents. Um, I'm sure there have been all sorts of learnings, uh, you know, from that process. What, what are what are some of the takeaways from the actual experience bit and you have had in working on these projects? Yeah, I would say, you know, a, a large one is the, the fact that the projects themselves are very large and they're multifaceted. <laughs> yeah. So we're a technology company and yet we have, you know, we have a marketing department. We have a sort of training for financial institutions and merchants. We've had to sort of ad adapt to the, the requirements of the early central banks. And, and it's been good for us because it's informed us what the, you know, what the problems are, what the requirements are, what the desires are of these central banks in testing and piloting uh, CBDCs. But really it's, it's the, the scope of the projects and, and the, the central banks would likely admit this as well. When, when they get into the project, they realize, oh, wow, there's really not a department that is untouched. There, like each department is impacted in some way. And so you can picture the ripple effects of that or the downstream effects. It's like change management within the organization, uh, detailed risk, risk assessment and risk management, risk mitigation. Um, operate, you know, the, the implementation of uh, operational policies and procedures and, and adjustment of existing policies and procedures, obviously legal assessment. And in some cases, the legal is, is relatively small. It's augmenting the central bank's ability to issue currency in a digital form. And in other cases, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a larger effort, which requires you know, specific mandates. Um, so it really is sort of scope of, of the project. And, and, you know, central banks are also then faced with the challenge that uh, fintechs and, and commercial banks have been faced with, um, which is like user, user acquisition. And, and this, again, speaks to the, the necessity of a, of a two-tier model where it's really important to have an ecosystem of fintechs in there um, that are all taking advantage of this uh, infrastructure as a public good. I know that I think that we share that sort of view that uh, that CBDCs can be considered uh, public good, like a public financial infrastructure yeah. good. And so it's crucial for, again, to achieve some of those early goals uh, that we mentioned, or, or rather the common goals that central banks are coming back with. It's, it's important for them to realize that, you know, they can't achieve them all on their own. They need a healthy ecosystem. They need the fintechs to be there, right? And, and that's going to foster that competition and increase adoption, uh, which, you know, in, indicates success of these sorts of projects. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they are so big. And, and again, that's what's so interesting about this. I mean, money is, is such a, you know, pervasive part of, of our world. And so when we're creating a, a new form, potentially, it's just, it touches a lot of things. Um, you know, we, we only have about a minute left, so I figure a good way to end it is the way Danell ended the panel, which is asking sort of, what, what do you see kind of for the future of CBDCs, you know, can kind of uh, focus on the next one to two years, what, what are, you know, what do you see coming? Uh well, what I hope to see coming is uh, more uh, standard, the definition of standards, um, uh, specifically around privacy and accountability. Uh, I think that these systems, there's a lot of potential good that they could do, but there's also, you know, in, in the wrong hands, they could also be harmful. And so I'd really like to see, you know, the continuation of, of the standards work that's been ongoing. It was, it was encouraging to see in the Fed paper uh, that, they stated whether or not they move forward with the digital USD, they do want to play a, a, um, a substantial role in, in standard setting. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to that. You know, we, we've set some of our own standards in house, but of course it requires higher level buy-in, uh, you know, sort of a G20 level uh, BIS, of course, as well. So really looking forward to that. Uh, and to be honest, I'm really, I'm looking forward to tangible uh, deployments of cross currency and cross asset, like atomic swaps. Yeah. The, these, these things have been tested um, in, in sort of more closed off lab settings and, and smaller pilot settings. I'm excited for like a remittance use case where we can get open up a, a, a really cost effective remittance corridor and, and reduce the settlement times, reduce the cost and have that atomic swap from currency to currency or cross asset, you know, integrate a, a tokenized security um, with a CBDC and, and start to experiment there for, for some of those real world uh, uh, applications. So yeah, th that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, Excellent. Sure. Yeah, no, that all of that would be amazing. Um, and I mean, you know, just to quickly answer my own question, my, my own view, I, I share a lot of what you just said. 
I also think uh, in 2022, we are going to see a lot more of uh, banks issuing stable coins as a way to sort of start to experiment and, and a way to start to show a model of some of what you were just saying, you know, see what it is, it really is like to do the cross-border atomic swap, things like that. And then central banks will be looking to that as kind of potential models. So that, that's my own uh, small prediction. But um, Simon, mm -hmm. thank you so much for, for being here and giving us insight from someone who's been so close to actual uh, real projects on this. Uh, Lauren, back over to you. Thank you so much. Me Thank too. you for joining. That is uh, a wrap for our program tonight. I just want to point everyone to the li uh, link in the chat if you want to dig deeper into a lot of the topics that our panelists talked about tonight. Uh, that's the SDF uh, white paper on understanding CBDCs, and it covers, again, a bunch of the topics that you heard about tonight. Uh, and again, if you want to rewatch this, the recording will be available um, on our, on our uh, website later. Uh, so thanks again, and we hope to see you guys at the next event.